Welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And Mike. As we reread the Aubrey Maturin novels of Patrick O'Brien. We're midway through the Ionian mission. So, Mike, we're close to the holidays. Is this going to be festive or is this going to be humbug? Catch us up with what happened last week and what kind of seasonal delights we have waiting for us this week. Oh, you bet, Ian. Well, sadly, not as many seasonal delights as we had a few books back. But we do have Jack and Steve been arriving at the Toulon blockade, certainly a Christmas destination we would all aspire to. And when they get there, they find Admiral Thornton, just a pale, frail shade of his former self, even though he's still as sharp as ever. Uh, The Admiral talks to Jack. He discusses intelligence matters with Stephen. And Jack learns from his friend, Hennage Dundas, that the managing of this complex and swiftly changing politics of the region, particularly the Barbary states, is wearing the Admiral out. Jack, Stephen, and the Admiral all agree that an action with the French fleet, if the fleet ever comes out, would really set the Admiral up and and cure him. There was a series of court-martial cases. We had some capital ones Mm. beginning and then some very ugly ones coming primarily from two ships, the main one being Admiral Hart's. A lot of petty grievances, dirty linen washing. And there's one foreign clerk who is poisoned before he can stand trial. Parson Martin, if we remember Mr. Martin, the bird-loving parson, who's had this real love for naval life after seeing the harsh punishment in all these capital cases, kind of the, the bloom is off the rose there a bit. And Jack dined with Admiral Mitchell, the admiral of the inshore fleet, and tells Stephen later about how in his career early, Mitchell was an ordinary seaman, was fogged around the fleet. And Jack speculates that Mitchell started unlucky and became very lucky. And he wonders if he, Jack, started as lucky Jack Aubrey, but is now becoming unlucky and perhaps may end up flogged around the fleet himself. Not a holiday special kind of thought there, leaving it. This week, We've got a little bit happier thoughts. Jack continues to improve the gunnery and the seamanship of his crew. He does have a moment of introspection about infidelity. We hear a sermon tied to lust, always always a Christmas special in the churches. And there is music <laughs> all around the ship and a whole host of quail. So I think quail are sort of sometimes a, a bit of a Christmas bird. I'm sure there's a carol in there somewhere. And Lieutenant Summers continues to demonstrate his character or lack thereof. And we have one, maybe two surprise characters, dear old friends, show up depending on how far we get today. Oh, fantastic. I'm feeling festive already, Mike. There you go. It being this time of the year, the weather isn't great, is it? There's a storm as Mitchell heads back to the inshore squadron. The storm is described as a shrieking nine-day mistral. It blows the fleet halfway over to Menorca. It says the storm did almost as much damage as a minor action. So this gets everybody's hatches battened down. And I think even without the storm, Jack's social life, as we head into chapter five, is pretty much limited to his own ship. Admiral Thornton's not a fan of entertaining himself. The captain of the fleet, not a fan of officers visiting between ships. And Rear Admiral Hart, we learn, did entertain, but didn't invite Jack. And nor did other captains who knew about the bad blood between Hart and Aubrey. So, Mike, Jack is left with just a couple of his friends. We've got Hennage Dundas on HMS Excellent. We've got Lord Garron on HMS Boyne. Are the only ones who can afford to disregard the ill will of Admiral Hart and invite Jack to dine. And, of course, luckily, our Jack also has his Stephen. Yes, yeah. What a gift to him. Well, Jack has got... His officers are running the ship itself, so he's busying himself improving the ship's gunnery and their seamanship. He's taken to running drills where he's essentially doing what's the best of the best of the other ships in the blockade squadron and then trying to get his men to beat their records and shifting sails and taking in reefs. And all the drilling, O'Brien writes, builds some resentment against Jack during the day, but every evening... He says, something like benevolence returned as the crew gathers for dancing on the forecastle and listening to the band. Oh. 
And we've had this before, haven't we? Um, a couple of books ago, the, the idea of it's almost a naval tradition that you entertain yourselves with whatever talent, with whatever resources you've got aboard the ship. Now, of course, we're aboard a ship of the line now, so there's plenty of musical talent on board. We hear that 40 men could play an instrument. We hear, hear that there's a, a decayed bagpipe maker from Cumberland, and Cumberland is part of England, for those of you who aren't sure, so... Not Scottish bagpipes, but a different kind of pipes. Ah. This helped remedy the lack of instruments. So the band's waiting. He's waiting there waiting on an order of sheet music, and I suspect also an order of instruments that Jack has made. Right, right. What they do find out, yeah, what they do find out is that there are plenty of men aboard who can sing. And we have Mr. Martin the Parson, who's staying aboard the Worcester, waiting for the Berwick that he's destined to join, whose uh, captain is dallying ashore. Mr. Martin's staying aboard the Worcester, and... Being a parson and having a bit of a musical ear, he's encouraging the choir to an attempt, an oratorio. We discover a little low-key musical reference for us here for the whole ship's company. The five young, toothless new men aboard were also word perfect in Handel's Messiah. Yeah, Brian tells us that some of the crew can read music, others can, well, let me read O'Brien, could not read music, but they had true ears, a retentive memory, a natural mm -hmm. Ability to sing in part, rarely out once they heard a piece. And the only trouble, and it proved to be insuperable, was that they confused loudness with excellence. And passages that were not so panissimo ben as to be inaudible were taken with the utmost power of the human voice. <laughs> oh, we've got them blasting out. And it, even you know, Brian tells us that Jack joins him with his powerful bass for the Hallelujah Chorus. And it lifts Jack's heart high. It's a really great image, isn't it? And Mike, there's a, a bit of a, a, a story here, I think, about the connection of oratorios and Handel and 19th century British musical culture. So first of all, the British got all gooey and crazy about oratorios in the 19th century, maybe strictly speaking a little after this. I think when Felix Mendelssohn arrived basically to stay and live in in London and introduced British society to the works of Bach and Handel and started composing his oratorios, the whole of civilized society in Britain went oratorio crazy in genteel cities in northern working class industrial towns everywhere there were choirs and i think o'brien's really hit the nail on the head here this is the kind of thing that 19th century brits really loved the other thing is for reasons that i think are a bit obscure the hallelujah chorus has a special place in the heart of brits so if you go nowadays to a performance of the hallelujah chorus and the audience are of a certain age you will find that the audience stands up for the Hallelujah Chorus. And I remember this happened on my honeymoon. I was in Edinburgh with my bride. We went to a performance of the Hallelujah Chorus in a big Methodist hall in Edinburgh, and the audience stood up. It's, it's a tradition here as well. Oh, yeah, wow. every time. Oh, is it as it well? Is. Oh, fantastic. Wow. And I don't know why. It's not, it's not got any association with the state or royalty or anything for us, and clearly it won't have for Americans, but we just seem to love it. Well, we hear that most of Jack's musical pleasure comes as, as he and Stephen play their way through Scarlatti, Hummel, Cherubini, and the pieces Jack had brought from London Box, Young Man. Uh, they finish one, and Stephen notes that the ship appears to have turned around while he was trying to play. And Jack, <laughs> in his, his subtle way, notes that the ship actually does that, it, as the fleet wears in succession at the end of every watch. <laughs> Stephen, you, it's been happening, you know, every eight to four hours here, and uh, yeah, did it again. <laughs> and Jack suggests finishing the port, and Stephen replies, I love this line, ghoul or gluttony is a beastish sin, said Stephen, but without sin there can be no forgiveness. Would there be any more of the Gibraltar walnuts left at all? <laughs> it's a great line. <laughs> it's a great line. So they eat some of the Gibraltar walnuts. I think we get Jack cracking them in his hand. And Jack expresses a bit of hope for forgiveness for Captain Harry Bennett. Harry Bennett's the captain of the Berwick. That's the captain of the ship to which Parson Martin is eventually destined to go. Um, but we learn that Captain Harry Bennett, in a situation that ought to be familiar to Jack, um, is delayed by his attachment to a young lady on shore. And Jack reminds Stephen that they'd met Harry Bennett at Ashgrove Cottage. Stephen remembers Bennett 
And he remembers this this quote from Lucretius. Mike, can you take us through that? Well, it's interesting. You know, we've got just three words of it. And our wiki for the O'Brien fandom uh, kind of gives us a little bit of it. It says it's pleasant when the winds are buffeting the waves on the great sea to watch from the land the great struggle of another. And I was like, that's a little foreboding. I'm not sure why Stephen called that a happy quote. But luckily, we got a little bit more, a, a great teacher at a, um, a private school had talked about this in context of actually some modern things, but she gives the fuller translation and she says, it's a delightful thing while the great sea rages to watch from the land another struggling with the waves. Not because this is in itself a delight, yet it is a delight to watch calamities from which you feel yourself safe, to look on a battle from some safe point of view, but nothing is more delightful than from some serene stronghold of knowledge to look down upon the wonderings and errors of other men and their efforts after mere wealth and power rather than knowledge and a quiet mind. So here, I think we can kind of see, ah, now I understand why Stephen finds this a delightful quote. You know, this is the people who are secure in the truth of philosophy and people who are not, who are looking for wealth and power here. Um, and, and why O'Brien perhaps inserts these three words perhaps comes a little bit clearer as we learn more about Captain Bennett's current troubles. It does. And I, I just want to say this is a really, really great extension of the quote. And this idea of looking down upon the wanderings and errors of men. Right. <laughs> That's pretty much a description in a nutshell of O'Brien and his book writing. So much so, right. In a, in a, in a position he often puts Stephen in, right? Except when it comes to himself. Yeah, from his serene stronghold of knowledge. I love it. So anyway, you're right, it does shed a bit of a light on Stephen's perspective on the the source of Captain Bennett's troubles. Um, Jack explains that Captain Bennett's uh, been noted as staying in Palermo a little bit too long. He's described as being moored head and stern to a red-headed wench. So, Mike, what's it like being moored head and stern to a, to, to a lady with Sicilian characters? <laughs> yes, not, not a redheaded wench on my end, but, you know, it's, it's where we uh, celebrate some of our decade anniversaries. Annie spent some time in Sicily a number of years and just absolutely loves it. And so when, uh, you know, when he says that Bennett stays in Palermo too long, I'm saying, can you really, can anybody ever stay in Sicily too long? Oh, oh. And it's funny, I worried as I read this next part that maybe Jack's got no self-awareness at all. It says, Jack adds, in all sober earnest, Stephen, I do hate to see a good officer-like man such as Bennett jeopardize his career hanging about in port for a woman. And, you know, we're thinking, oh, not that many books ago, you could have substituted the name Aubrey for the name Bennett. No question about it. Jack even says, I might invite Bennett to dinner and drop some hints. And maybe he suggests that Stephen could drop in some more of these classical references about that fellow who contrived to hear the sirens. And will you do that? And Stephen says, I will not. (laughs) And Jack, I'm with you. And I'm thinking, has Jack got absolutely zero self-awareness? But it it appears that he does. Um, O'Brien writes, no, I suppose not, said Jack. It is a most infernally delicate thing to take notice of, even to a man you know very well. He thought of the time when he and Stephen had competed for Diana's quite unpredictable favors. He had behaved much as Harry Bennett was behaving now, and he had savagely resisted anything in the way of tactful hints on the part of his friends. It's interesting, as he's thinking about this, he looks over at the dressing case that Diana had given Stephen. And that they're now using really as, as a polished music stand with all these candles and gold and gleaming wood, what uh, Jack calls an unearthly radiance. It says, still, he said, I do hope he comes in tomorrow. Psalms may dull the Admiral's edge. So he's hoping that with Thornton being a little bit of a blue light Admiral, if Bennett comes in on a Sunday, maybe the Admiral's not going to take him completely to pieces here. <laughs> It's a, it's a great bit of compassion. and um, we've, we've talked as the story has wound on about how we want to hear or we're hoping to hear 
a, a bit of redemption for Jack and for Jack to get a bit of his mojo back. And I think my part of Jack's mojo is his connection with other people in the service and his his friends like Dundas and also like Bennett. So this is a little little hint that Jack is on the mend. Now, the wind is bringing up the Berwick. The, the Berwick is bringing the possibility of a little bit of a, <laughs> a confrontation for Captain Bennett. But the Berwick's also bringing a wind that brings with it a large flock of migrating quail. These quail flying overhead the fleet have been struck by a headwind after flying all night, and they drop to the deck of the Worcester exhausted. And might we get this very bizarre scene with members of the crew scrambling to pick up these quails. And I think, first of all, I'm thinking they're scrambling to pick them up because they're trying to make the ship look spick and span and tidy for inspection. I think there's also yeah. an element of gluttony and gewel about this because they're thinking, well, there's, there's some good eating on a quail. And Martin is horrified. So he scrambles to protect the quails from the men, uh, at least those men who aren't busy getting ready for inspection. And Martin seeks Stephen out and asks to invoke Jack's protection of the quails. And as the ship beats to divisions, bringing the quail gathering to a stop, we get this great scene of Jack removing a quail from his epaulette with great composure to start the inspection. It says, through the steady, gentle fall of exhausted birds. Now, Mike, this this seemed to me to be really bizarre. This this quail thing. I'm thinking it, it must be one some combination of either first of all an actual incident that O'Brien read about on a ship, or uh, some kind of metaphysical symbolism, um, or an illusion, or a quotation, or just Patrick O'Brien messing with us. So. I'm, I'm going to hold off for a second because I think there may be an illusion coming, but I'm going to say I spot a connection, right? I spot a connection with our favorite sci-fi series, which is Star Trek. And I spot a connection that some of our listeners might remember. There's an episode of Star Trek called The Trouble with Tribbles. We're going to post a little clip out on our social media, The Trouble with Tribbles, written in 1967, where these cute, fluffy creatures landing all over the Starship Enterprise, including on the bridge, it says in the Wikipedia article that this Star Trek episode with the cute furry creatures was originally seen by the writer and the producer as trite, shtick, and hokey. And to be honest, that's what I first thought when I read about these quails. But then they rewrote the story, and actually, in the end, it ended up having some comedy value and some character value and a bit of an ecological message as well. So, Mike, what might be the real message behind the quail episode? Well, it's funny. And when I first read this, the thing that came to mind for me was the biblical story of the Israelites in the desert with Moses. And I thought, but why is he using that here? Is it maybe about greed and about Bennett and what people want? And But I thought, I, I don't know. That's a, It's a, a little bit of an obscure reference, but we'll, we'll stick a pin in that one, right? Yeah. Okay. So Jack's going to continue the inspection. He notices that he's got a drowned baby simmering in the kettle. And by the way, bravo to uh, listener Tony Millionaire Mackies. That's his screen name on Facebook for expanding on our description of suet last week. If you want to join the conversation about suet, you can jump on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash lubbers hole. And the inspection reaches the sick bay. And Stephen warns Jack that the quail may be poison. And Jack passes this message on to Pullings and says, stop the men from eating them. And now we get Mr. Martin coming up with a sermon and reading his text. So tell us about the text here, Mike. Yeah, this is great. So I'm sitting there reading this and then thinking, well, maybe that's the reference. And then sure enough, that's exactly where Martin goes to the, the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verses 31 through 34. Um and he has church rigged. All these hundreds of men are sitting around and Martin reads out in a strong voice. And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp as it were a day's journey on this side. And as it were a day's journey on the other side round the camp and as it were two cubits high upon the face of the earth. So two miles around. Two cubits would be about, about three feet high. You know, whether they're flying three feet high or whether they're actually three feet high's worth of, of quail, there's an incredible number of quails. 
And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. And he that gathered least gathered 10 homers. A homer is essentially about what a donkey could carry on its back. So they spread them all abroad for themselves around the camp. So that they're spreading them out, drying them out to preserve them. And then it, it gets very dark. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, so they've just taken you know, their first bite of it or are about to, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava. And because, uh, the, the scripture reads, because there they buried the people that lusted. So that's that's Martin's scriptural reference that he reads out. And then Martin adds that this, you know, the name of this place in Hebrew signifies the graves of those that lusted. And from this, we are to understand that lust is the gateway to the grave. So it's really interesting here um, that that Martin has this. Um, and and earlier, Stephen had warned his assistant about eating the quail. And, and he had said, apart from Mr. Martin's moral issue that they came to us for shelter and, and now we can't destroy them. Stephen had said, you're to observe that the quail eating noxious seeds on the African main may well be noxious herself. Remember Dioscorides' words and remember the miserable fate of the Hebrews. So we've gotten a, an earlier reference to the Hebrews from Stephen. Now, Martin, as you say, somehow has whipped this sermon up in real time. Yeah, pretty pretty smart work for sermonizing from from Mr. Martin there. Absolutely, to, to sort of get everybody to cease and desist here. Um, you know, a couple of, you know, Stephen always has these great references here. This Discordes uh, actually was sort of lived from 40 AD to 90 uh, AD. And it was a Greek physician and pharmacologist who wrote this multi, uh, multi-volume multi work that was the foremost classical source of modern botanical knowledge and leading pharmacology texts for the next 16 centuries. So pretty, pretty amazing work is a guy that, you know, went around with the Roman army, made all these empirical observations and then collected them in his work. So Sounds a lot like Stephen in some ways, but the only quail reference I could, I could find in his work was talking about that there's a plant that the quail eats, which makes their meat more, as he says, vicious. Um, but we do get, if you kind of dig into this reference in numbers in the Bible, you know, a lot of people have looked at this, and, and usually it's a lot about greed, that we had a year earlier, the Hebrews kind of wandering around in the desert, curse God because they don't have anything to eat. And, and they say back when we were still in Egypt, you know, we had all kinds of things to eat. So Moses speaks to God. God says bread during the day, manna, manna, and meat, quail uh, in the evenings. But they're always admonished, don't be greedy, don't take more than you need. And if you do, it rots. And then a year later in this place, in the, in the quote that Martin's referring to, they complain again because their diet is so monotonous. Same thing, morning and night. And God promises to send them enough meat for a month. And this enormous number of quail, we just heard this story, are, are blown up and taken in by the Israelites. But then they die when they eat them. And so people have for years and years tried to speculate on, are there any logical explanations here? Is this just a, you know a, a kind of a metaphorical story? Um, but there are a number of different possibilities mentioned, which are not unlike a little bit of what Stephen talks about. The first one is not that, that it's bacterial poisoning because they've been improperly dried. But the other one that's gotten a lot of play is this idea that the quail on this big migration come across Africa and they eat the nuts of almond trees. Uh, and the digestive system results in this big buildup of hydrogen cyanide, which the quail can tolerate it's created in their stomach and the digestive system releases it but if you start to open up that quail the gas or actually tasting it once it hits your lips can can kill you immediately so you know it who knows maybe uh maybe there's a rational explanation here and maybe Stephen was providing awfully good warning to the rest of the crew 
Oh, it, it's one of those really intriguing references, isn't it? It's got a bit of natural philosophy and a bit of classical history and a bit of the Bible. Oh, great work. Really, really great work. And apparently this influx of quail, the landing on ships when the wind turns, is a pretty common occurrence in, in that migration pattern. Oh, right. So it's not so fantastical after all. Very cool. No, amazing. Who knew? Uh, Brian knew, right? Indeed he did. So, Mike, I'm thinking that um, I'm, I'm peckish for a little bit of quail, but I think I think I may also need to examine my conscience. So, shall we make this a moment for a quick pause? I think that's a great idea, Ian. We'll be right back. So, there's something that we want to tell you all about the way that we're planning to develop the podcast going forward and give you new ways to get involved in the life of the podcast and help us out as well. We are now accepting patrons for The Lover's Hole. We're not asking anybody to pay for this. We're not going to have ads on this. It's always going to be free to download. But if you would like to help defray some of the expenses of producing The Lover's Hole, we're now giving you an opportunity to do that easily and directly. And in return for your help, we'd love to offer you the chance to stay closely involved with the podcast, to get access to some patrons-only specials that we'll be creating, get the inside scoop on some of our materials and where the show is going next. It's a great opportunity, we hope, for you all to get involved. We'd love it if you can get on board. You can find us and find out about the opportunities to help us out at patreon.com forward slash lubber's hole you'll know you'll have found the right place because you'll see our logo and our graphics right there. There are loads of content creators on the internet who manage to engage with their audiences via Patreon. We're really happy that it seems to suit us and you, our listeners, really well. So we hope that you'll enjoy participating with us in this way. And that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash lovers all. A glass of wine with all of you. Welcome back. You're still with The Lubber's Hole, and Ian and Mike have been talking about quail. Not partridges in the pear tree. Now, that's a whole different kettle of fish, if you will. <laughs> that's right. So, after church, the quail, to extend into another metaphor, the quail are now regarded as Jonah's. This message about them being potentially poisonous has been successfully passed on through the ship. These Jonah birds are now being encouraged to leave the ship by the crew. Jack signals Bennett, Harry Bennett of the Berwick, the guy with the Sicilian connection, to come and join them for dinner. And he introduces Captain Bennett to his new parson, Mr. Martin, praises Martin for his great sermonizing, emphasizing the consequences of lust, the graves of those who lusted. And I can just imagine um, Jack Aubrey laying it on a bit thick here, hoping that it would serve <laughs> as a prelude to the veiled warning that he'd hoped to give Bennett. So, meanwhile, I think what we actually get is Bennett's just overflowing with excitement about this relationship he has with Miss Sarah Capriloa's charms. That's his young lady. Bennett shows Jack a lock of her red hair and goes on to make a Nelson connection. I think he's trying to sell the red-headed lady idea pretty strong to Jack here because Nelson is selling it pretty high. He says, Nelson kissed her when she was a child and you may do so once we are married. Nice. And I, and I think great work by Harry Bennett. It's probably just about saved him from a really, really heavy-footed, ham-fisted intervention by Jack. But I think it's left Jack with pause for thought. Jack, we learn, has a hard time sleeping at that night. That's really unusual for Jack unless he's thinking about legal problems. Jack reflects, it is a very great while since I kissed anyone, he said as he heard three bells strike in the middle watch and the discreet cry of the nearer lookout, life boy, starboard quarterdeck, starboard gangway, and it will be even longer before I do so again. There is no duller life on earth than a blockade. They're sailing back and forth in this endless blockade, always looking, never seeing anything, but sea and sky, we see no enemy, we see no resupply ships, we come rain, which stops the dancing, drops the morale aboard the ship. O'Brien says it drops the morale half a tone, and it builds this sense of monotony, and I think that monotony is leading the officers to drink, and none more so than Lieutenant Summers, who's got his own private store. 
Yeah, yeah. This is, you know, Summers, we've had these hints into Summers' character. And, and now Summers has the watch. And the usual order to wear at the end of a watch is changed at the last minute to an order to tack together. Jack's below. Summers is on deck. He has the watch, as I said. And uh, Jack hears this incredible chaos on deck. He runs up, finds that the Worcester has missed stays and is about to run into the Pompey. Uh, Jack takes command. He avoids the collision as O'Brien writes, Summers stared bemused. Uh, Jack asks him how this lubberly state of affairs came about. And Summers just nonchalantly says anyone can miss stays. But he's got this very thick, heavy voice. Clear he's been drinking. And then Jack explains exactly what happens. He says that Summers has been handling the ship like a cutter, not like the dull sailing ship of the line. And it's a difference that he's explained to Summers many times before. He dresses Summers now pretty strongly. And Summers doesn't have the reaction that I think most officers would. No, Summers really loses his, um, you know what, here. Clearly, there's this bubbling resentment on Summers' part for Jack and also fueled by really way too much liquor. And Summers cries out. Remember, this is on deck in view and in earshot of the whole crew. Always finding fault. Always finding fault with me. Whatever I do is wrong, cried Summers, suddenly very pale. And then breaking out still louder, tyranny and oppression. That's what it is. Damn your blood. I'll show you who I am. And his hand moved towards a belaying pin in the fife rail. But at the same moment, Mowat gripped his arm. And in the stunned silence, Jack said, Mr. Pullings, order Mr. Summers to leave the deck. Wow. Wow, indeed. Holy smokes. Now, this, this sounds like not one of those petty court-martial cases that we heard earlier, uh, mm. but this sounds like a real deal here. Yeah, this is... You, know, you talked about Jack and his compassion and, and, you know, Jack kind of and his redemption, but Jack doesn't do any of that, right? Mm -mm. No, he says, Summers is going to have to leave. He may invalid, he may exchange, he may do anything he likes, but he will never serve under me. And on the one hand, this is career death in many respects for Summers, at least it, it could be. And I think that this has the feeling for Jack that he's kept his cool and he saved Summers from himself and he's going to take care of the problem. He's got all the reason that he needs to take care of the problem. But the crew is a bit surprised. They wonder at this absence of a full-blown punishment and they keep talking about it. Even after the... the uh, the shipment of instruments is received from Valletta and the Oriatorio starts to take on its full dimensions. They're still talking after the ship changes from serving wine to grog and we see more of this fighting. We see more disobedience. It says disobedience, ineptitude, accidents, naval crime and naval punishment. And Mike, I don't know about you. I, I felt like this, this is a little bit of a disappointing moment for Jack. Summers writes a letter of apology asks Stephen, of all people, to intercede and promises to leave the service if Jack will overlook the incident. But once he realises he, Summers, won't be court-martialed, he takes offence. He says that neither he nor his father or the sway of his family in Parliament will allow Jack to slight him with impunity. He starts to make dark hints that he might call Jack out and challenge him to a duel. And not very many people are going to listen to him. And he arranges an exchange, rather than leaving the service, he arranges an exchange with Mr. Rowan of the Colossus. And I see, Mike, here, there's a little bit of an erosion of Jack's dignity. Maybe even you might say Jack's masculinity and authority. Uh, maybe apparently from Jack's inaction. Now, his composure and his compassion have made him fall perhaps on the side of letting Summers get away with this a little bit. And some of the crew members were disappointed at not being able to stand up for Jack at a court-martial. And they all kind of rehearse and practice and polish their lines that they wish they could deliver in a court-martial, exaggerating their support for Jack, of course. But I, I think I was with the crew here. I felt a bit sold short by Summers getting off with this ending here. No, I agree. I, I really, you know, we've had so many hints about Summers and, and especially to take it this far and not see anything happen. I'm I was really a bit at a loss here. Yeah. 
Ah, <sighs> so they're waiting for the oratorio. They've they've only got their upcoming Hamlet production to break their monotony, and we know what Hamlet symbolizes in terms of relationships gone sour and madness and stuff. Um, young Mister Calby is going to play Polonius, which is hilarious, and Stephen finds Jack, Pullings, Mowat, and Bonden all together beaming on deck. They've asked Stephen to come on deck so that he can be shown something. And seeing their beaming faces, Stephen suspects a trick. Remember, Mike, I think he's remembering not very long ago how his attempt to make a game of Professor Graham came a little bit unstuck. And I think he's a little bit wise to the fact that these heavy-handed witticisms might be in play. So he suspects one of these, and he goes on deck wanting to know, what is this surprise that you found? Yeah, it's it's so nice to and Jack, you know, Jack's kind of beaming and he says, here is my surprise. Come see what you make of her. So Stephen's cautious. He says what appears to be a ship, conceivably a man of war. Jack asks him to look a little bit closer. And Stephen says, well, there's nothing to worry about. You know, we're in the midst of this big squadron. This is only one small ship. But but as he says it, Stephen starts thinking that ship seems somehow familiar to him. Stephen, said Jack, in a low, happy tone, she is our dear surprise. So she is too, cried Stephen. I recognise that complexity of uh, rails in front. I, I recognise the very place I slept on her on summer nights. God love her, the worthy boat. And by the way, calling her a boat is, is not okay, but never mind. It does my heart good to see her, said Jack. She was the ship he loved best after the Sophie, Jack's first command. He had served in her as a midshipman in the West Indies, a time he remembered with the liveliest pleasure. And years later, he had commanded her in the Indian Ocean. He knew her through and through, as beautiful a piece of shipbuilding as any that had been launched from the French yards. And Mike, here we get the text that I think we've heard many times. Surprise has her own special family of epithets. And here we come. A true thoroughbred very fast in the right hands, weatherly, dry, a splendid sailor on a bowling, and a ship that almost steered herself once you understood her ways. She was old to be sure, she'd been much knocked about in her time, and she was small, a 28-gun frigate of under 600 tons, little more than half the weight of the 36 and 38-gun ships that were usual now, to say nothing of the recent heavy frigates built to match the Americans. Indeed, she was scarcely a frigate at all to modern eyes. But she had teeth for all that, and with her speed and quickness of turn, she could take on ships of far greater bulk. She had even had one perilous brush with a French ship of the line, giving almost as good as she got. And I think, Mike, there he's talking about the encounter with Linois squadron in the Indian Ocean. Remember it well? Right. Going back to the text. <laughs> if Jack were ever enormously rich... And if she were sold, if the surprise were ever sold out of the service, there was no other ship in the Royal Navy he would sooner buy as the most perfect yacht in existence. Wow. Oh. So, Mike, it, it's a lovely moment. You know, the surprise has been turned into a character in the canon here, and it's like having an old friend come back on stage. We should stick as well a pin in this idea of the most perfect yacht. I have a feeling that that's been left there for us, <laughs> for the future. These little breadcrumbs of O'Brien, just fabulous. Yeah, I I love this. I was just glowing reading this. I thought, this is like seeing your first love again. And uh, oh. it's wonderful. Oh, well, and it gets even better. The surprise is bringing post. And so everybody on every ship is impatient to get their mail and their newspapers, everything coming from home. And uh, O'Brien tells us that after an impossibly long time, the signal breaks out for Worcester to come collect her post. Jack is reading through his letters. He learns that everything is well at home, except for some minor childhood illnesses. And that a strange blight had struck the roses back at home. And I'm hoping that this is not relating back to O'Brien's opening metaphor about marriage and bed of roses. But no. Uh, you know, Stephen's reading his mail as well. And Sophie is telling Jack that young Yellow had brought Diana to visit many times. She says that Mrs. Williams, we recall Mrs. Williams, said that young Yellow was the most handsome man she'd ever seen. And she says, and so beautifully rich. <laughs> 
Um, she reports that they have a new neighbor, Admiral Sanders, somebody we may see again here. And Jack is surprised because he reads through all these letters, all those other letters. And Sophie never says a word about the lawyers. There are no letters from the lawyers, nothing about the lawyers. And he can't decide if this is a good omen or a bad. And he decides to flip a coin to see which it is. Yeah. And he misses the coin. <gasps> bad luck. And it lands right. on Stephen's letter, the one that he's read after the letters from Diana, who we learn is not pregnant, after the letters from Sir Joseph Blaine, after the scientific letters, after coded risk reports and dispatches. The coin lands on a letter that appears to be telling him that he was a cuckold, that his wife was deceiving him with Yagi Yellow, a Swedish attache. And Mike, it's a little bit strange. First of all, I read that and think, oh, here we go. This is the old Diana story again. But Stephen's okay with it. He's trying to break the code of the writer's identity. The text says, the letter and the puzzle amused him. The malignancy and its transparent covering of righteous indignation were perfect of their kind. And but for his ingrained sense of secrecy, he would have shown it to Jack. In the event, he did no more than return the guinea with a private smile. And I think he, he notices uh, some things about the handwriting, some things about the spelling of Stephen Maturin's name that suggest that the writer is French. And Stephen is straight away willing to see this as mischief making on the part of some French spy. So, OK, Stephen, good. <laughs> right, right. This was a little disconcerting for me, especially after Mrs. comment about so beautifully rich. Oh, well. Stephen and Jack exchange news from home. And then Stephen tells Jack that in the morning, a bitling ship is going to carry him to Barcelona. So his first of his secret intelligence missions here, Jack is very sad to see him go. But Stephen assures him they'll meet up in Mahan again soon. They're interrupted as the captain of the Dryad prepares to come aboard. Now, hearing that it's the Dryad, Jack calls that ship a slab-sided sloop a horrible old lumpish round stern Dutch tub. It sounds a little bit like the Stevens adjective stacks here. And, yes, and we yeah. remember you were really good in, in thinking that we've heard about the dryad before and, and we may hear about her again, right? We might. So we flipped a few chapters back in the canon. We found in the surgeon's mate in the Baltic, we have a reference that a midshipman sent by the officer of the watch came to say that the weather had disclosed 28 sail of merchantmen together with a frigate and a brig thought to be Melampus and Dryad. So these two ships have been within hail of each other before, but Dryad's only a brig. It's not going to be a big deal. And she's clearly not the most beautiful ship in the world. So. Well, Jack goes on deck and he returns to the cabin with the Dryad's captain, William Babington. So here's Babington. Yay, back Babington. Yeah. Surprise. We have Babington, who is himself a surprise, if you will, in both meanings of the word. You know, they all catch up over drinks, Stephen and Jack and Babington, until Babington all of a sudden says he has to quickly leave to wait on Admiral Hart so as not to put a foot wrong with him, since he, Babington, is, in his words, deep enough in his bad books already. And we know Jack is not in good graces with Hart, but now I'm wondering here, what's what's up with Babington here? It's really, really funny. We've had this characteristic of Babington as a bit of a ladies' man, albeit a not a very good-looking ladies' man, all the way through the novels. You might remember back in post-Captain, it was Babington who was volunteering to ride the uh, the carriage with Diana and the, uh, the bean-fed horse. So he's got this reputation as being a bit of a player with the ladies, um, it turns out that Hart had caught Babington consorting with Hart's daughter Fanny back home. Hart was even madder after he forbade Babington from the house, but later learned that Fanny was still writing to him. So this sounds like not just one of Babington's liaisons. This sounds like Babington's pretty serious about young Fanny Hart. Um, right. Hart had told him that if he was looking for a fortune to go after French prizes and that Fanny was meat for his master and Babington really didn't like this meat for his master expression and it's funny, we get this little conversation with Babington saying to Jack and Stephen wasn't this a mean thing to say now Jack and Stephen remember that Fanny is not particularly the fairest example of the sex and wonder therefore why Babington might be getting labeled by heart as a fortune hunter since you know Babington himself is well off and she is no heiress but Babington puts them straight he says oh yes she is 
a 20,000 pounder, which is quite a weight of metal for an heiress back in the early 19th century <laughs> because there's this inheritance. So Babington's been trying to, to cut out this heiress from the Hart family. Hart Sr. is having none of it. Um, Babington believes that Hart is arranging a marriage for Fanny to another person that we know about, Mike, Mr. Secretary Ray of the Admiralty. And it's panto season, so Ray gets a boo and a hiss at the moment if you're a, a panto lover. Boo, Mr. Secretary Ray. Babington believes that Hart had him transferred to the Mediterranean just to get him out of London and away from Fanny. Babington says he can keep an eye on me here while they're haggling about the dowry. The marriage will come off the minute the writings are signed. Wow. Oh, poor old Babington. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, as you've been saying, you know, we know Babington has his own monies, his own family that's well in there. And uh, apparently this is really somebody that Babington is interested in. And now we've got another complication with Hart, Jack and Babington being such good friends from such a far way back. Uh, I hate that. And that's how we end chapter five. As we open chapter six, Jack's mood's changed a little bit. We find him, he has this serial letter to Sophie. He just continues to add to it, add to it, add to it until the post goes out again. And Jack's thinking about all the creature comforts he has on this large ship. And he's writing about his ungrateful discontent ever since Stephen left, right? He's got more space than anybody on the ship, but he just does not like living and dining alone as the Navy prescribes that a captain must. O'Brien tells us that other captains dealt with it by bringing their wives or mistresses. They sailed with friends if they could stand the forced proximity for that long, or they took to drinking, sometimes turning strange, crotchety, and absolute. And we're starting to wonder about Jack's emotional state here a little bit. Yeah, and O'Brien goes on and describes Jack's feeling, his perspective about this. He says, so far, Jack had been unusually lucky in this respect. From his first command, he had nearly always sailed with Stephen Maturin, and it had proved the happiest arrangement. As a surgeon, Dr. Maturin was very much part of the ship, having his own independent function and being no more than nominally subject to the captain. But... Since he was not an executive officer, their intimacy caused no jealousy or ill feeling in the wardroom. And although he and Jack Aubrey were almost as unlike as men could be, unlike in nationality, religion, education, size, shape, profession, habit of mind, they were united in a deep love of music. And many and many an evening had they played together, violin answering cello or both singing together, far into the night. Wow. So, Mike, this is a bit of a low moment. Stephen's just left the ship on his mission. Jack is reflecting on the loneliness of command and how the one thing that's made the loneliness tolerable for him has been his friendship with Stephen and that part of that friendship has been represented in music, the idea of the violin and the cello singing together far into the night. How is he going to manage? How is he going to manage on his own in the cabin? How is he going to manage without his musical companion? What kind of music has he got available to him? Remember, they still have those manuscripts from old Bach. And what's he going to make of that? And where's that going to take us next in the story? What's going to happen to the Worcester? What's going to happen to the Worcester? What's going to happen to Babington and the Dryad? You know, we've got, uh, I think, a lot setting up here. O'Brien's got a lot of things coming together. Since we have questions in our mind about Bach, we're going to uncover a little bit more, I think, next time, Mike, about one particular piece that Jack's going to uncover. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper into musical practice itself. We've got an interview with our friend David Curtin, professor of music and Patrick O'Brien fan. We're going to talk about musical practice and musical tradition in the canon and beyond. I'm really looking forward to that. It was a great interview. So what do you say? Next week, Ian, to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien. Mike, with all my heart.
They seem to be gorged. Gorged? On my grain? Kirk, I am going to hold you responsible. There must be thousands of them. Hundreds of thousands. One million seven hundred seventy-one thousand five hundred sixty-one. 